Okay, Jenny, I'll stay. She was my most special friend. understand what they meant in 20 pages worth of material so and then all at the same time in moving in parallel we have ISO 14971 on risk management so why now well uh, FDA claims it's gonna not only eliminate the redundancy but save industry a whopping four hundred and thirty nine million dollars which I don't know who what kind of accountants they have doing their math for them but this is not the direction it's going as, as far as saving money but if we really look at the context behind the original QSR that was published in 1996 it's all about the preamble because ever since then when they wanted to say what they meant in the QSR, they referenced the preamble, which was over twice as long as the actual regulation itself. So what we have now in the quality management system regulation is a combination of ISO 1345 that has been um, almost fully recognized and codified um, and ISO 9000 in terms of clause 3. The rest of 9000 has not been codified. But if we look at what regulation versus expectation is, so now we have ISO 9000 clause 3, ISO 13485, then, but then the QMSR says, hey, we're not codifying 14971, but if you want to know what we mean every time the word risk is said, you should know what 14971 means. Um, and then if you want to know what we mean by a certain clause of ISO 1345, you really should read the notes. But we're not codifying either one of those. So now we have this kind of a difference in the regulation versus expectation. And then it gets more complicated because we've got that practical guide because if you want to understand what ISO 1345 means, you need to understand what that 200 page practical guide to it means. And then it keeps going because now we have a new preamble to the QMSR just like we had the preamble to the QSR. And the QMSR was 101 pages and about 90 some odd were preamble. So that is more context to the big picture of what they mean when they say QMSR. Except for the few areas 
that they chose not to harmonize to the ISO 13485. So those five big key differences are the definition, labeling and packaging, UDI, signature and date requirements, and the concept of uh, what it means for reporting and correction and removals in the U.S. So the definitions, it's more than just semantics because now we have the FD&C Act that you have to consider because sometimes it takes precedence over the ISO 13485 and the 9000 definition. And then there are other 21 CFRs where those definitions may take precedence. So it's not very uh, cut and dry and sometimes both apply. So it can be more than differences in interpretation. So now we have the term device master record that's replaced with the medical device file. On its surface, that doesn't seem like a very big deal because very literally, it is just the difference of adding the intended use to the what used to be the device master record. However, if you look in the practical guide, it is also a whole litany of other materials that are not normally a part of a device master record. It also changes the terms from safety and performance is saying it's the same thing as safety and efficacy. Now the FD&C Act is written around safety and efficacy, not safety and performance, because those, <coughs> in my mind, and per Merriam and Webster, are two very different concepts. So you also have uh, differences in labeling and packaging. So you still uh, have, they retained the requirements in 21 CFR 820. They added a new part um, in part 35 and 45 for labeling and packaging. Um, and then the existing 21 CFR 801 requirements for labeling still must be fulfilled on top of that. So that's an area where they retain their original definitions and concepts. So labeling, again, they, they're uh, retaining the FD&C definition, but they have chosen to still not define what is meant by marketing, which I think is fascinated for a brand new regulation in today's, uh, you know, social media, websites, all of these marketing uh, venues that did not exist when the original regulations were published. They're still not defining what it means by marketing, although they will send you a warning letter if right. you're not following what their expectations are in that area. So for UDI requirements, they are still, uh, they put that now in that part 35 for record keeping requirements. And then you still have to comply with the 21 CFR 830. For signature and date requirements, the 21 CFR Part 11 will uh, stay in effect. Um, Nellie will tell you this is one of her favorite buttons in an audit, and uh, I think that you can expect that the FDA will have increased focus on it because it is one of the few and unique areas that they did retain in the QMS are. So I was actually with an FDA auditor, and she goes, oh, now we're done with your inspection. Do you have any questions? And I said, Yes! And I, I go, everybody's looking at this risk-based approach for software. And I go, does that apply to Part 11? She goes, no. Part 11's a law. We have absolutely no wiggle room around Part 11. Now, that being said, there's other ways of getting around it, which I can talk about later on in another subject. But as far as the FDA inspectors are aware, they will cite you if you have not documented your validation strategy for Part 11. Mm -hmm. yep. And then I think you can, you're going to see more of that. So this is one that is interesting to me because this is where they're talking out of both sides of their mouth in the term of corrections. So in the FDA, in terms of 
product in the field that means something very specific. It means that you are taking action on product that has left your control and distribution. However, they are um, maintaining, sorry, they are maintaining both that concept, which is expressed in part 806, but they're also adding in the term correction per ISO 1345, taking in terms of corrective and preventive action, where it starts with the correction of product that may be in your facility, may be out of your facility. So now it's gonna be super important to <coughs> differentiate when you say the word correction in a kappa, mm -hmm. like are you talking about product that's in your control or out of your control and something you should have notified FDA about? So answers to all your burning questions about QMSR, because there are a, a, there's a, a few. So will the FDA accept ISO certifications in lieu of audits? And the answer is no. They are still not requiring ISO certifications. They will not recognize ISO certifications. And just because you have an ISO certification, they do not presume that you also um, are, are compliant with the QMSR. So they will still recognize MDSAP certifications, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the intended timeline is for implementation is by February of 2026. Ironically, this is when the QSR turns 50 and it dies. So in terms of records, so under the QSR, records like supplier audit, internal audit, and management review are exempt from being able to be inspected by the FDA. However, under the QMSR, they say, hey, it's all fair game, which is only, you only know this, by the way, by reading the preamble to the QMSR. And so therefore, now everything is fair game. And the reason they say that it's fair game is that why should the U.S. be any different than any other regulatory jurisdictions in terms of what we do or do not have access to? Also, under MDSAP, they already had access to these records, which most people don't realize. So, what happens if ISO 1345 is revised? This is one of my favorite parts because now ISO 1345 for the US is a regulation, not a voluntary standard. So what happens, because it goes up for revision every three years, it doesn't mean it necessarily gets revised, but it's coming up again. So we, as just as long as it took to harmonize, we could come deharmonize just as fast, if not faster, should they make changes that FDA then has to go through the whole regulatory process that it took it for, since 1996 to get to in the first place. So there's a number of procedures like quality manuals that are very technically not a requirement under the QSR that are now going to be required underneath the QMSR that if you are already have an ISO 1345 um, certification, maybe it's not a big deal for you. However, if you don't and you have a quality system that only um, complies with the QSR, that there, there could be differences like this that are going to be a bigger deal to those types of companies. My last FD inspection, she asked for quality manual. A little louder? At my last FD inspection, my, my inspector asked for my quality manual, even though it, she was just an FD inspection in compliance with FDA. Mm -hmm. So they're asking for them. Already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the quality system inspection technique? Well, it is going to go away and it's gonna go away because it's built around the QSR entirely 
and they have not published what that new inspection technique is going to be, it's very likely it's going to be either the MDSAP directly or the MDSAP indirectly in some way. So what does this mean for MDSAP? Well, some uh, tasks are going to stay the same where there are still differences like the UDI requirement, but some tasks are going to go in way entirely where they have harmonized. So hopefully I've answered a lot of your burning questions here on the QMSR. And so in conclusion, your secrets to success are you really need to know the QMSR, the comments, the practical guide, all the standards it's referencing. Um, be proactive, like two years might sound like a lot of runway, but if you only have, a, if you don't have an ISO 1345 certificate, then um, there's going to be more to do than you anticipate, especially in terms of uh, creating records around the new procedures and activities that you need to be prepared for. You need to have a mock audit so you can practice and put your quality management system um, through the paces before the new inspectors get out there. You can also anticipate that what you knew for in, uh, FDA inspections will have gone away because also most of the inspectors are retiring because I've been told by more than one FDA inspector they didn't, they didn't want to fool with learning this new regulation and the new methodology and that they were retiring, which is going to be left with people that are coming up through the FDA ranks that might not have ever known the QSR in the first place. Um, and then, you know, tentatively become familiar with that MDSAP audit model is very likely that that is going to be your new um, inspection technique. They're also having a retention problem in the Bay Area, Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. My last inspector, literally, I think it was her 10th inspection. Louder, please. The last inspection was like her 10th, she was like her 10th solo, and they're actually taking the information and they gather it, and then they take two days away from you to read it, and then they come back with questions, then they take it and they go away, and then they come back. It's not the, the scenario where they park it anymore. You know why? Because they have to go and ask their bosses now. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because they don't have in, uh, experience mm -hmm. in and of themselves. And I've had an uh, inspection, mm -hmm. um, this was uh, some time ago, but he left the room to call his boss. Mm -hmm. His boss gave him an answer and it didn't matter that she hadn't seen the evidence, we couldn't come back and show him a new piece of information because his boss had already said, yep. give them a 483. Even though it was something minor and we were able to like follow up right away. That's so. the same thing in my scenario. We, I, she actually had gone off and then wrote the 43 and said, here's what I'm gonna write up. I'm like, but we showed you this evidence and we've got this. She goes, no, I was told to write it. And I'm like, okay, no, mama said. So, at least these guys have to be updated. Your quality manual, your management review agenda, because 1345 has a lot of very specific clauses for management review, but it also has some that are not uh, obvious but implied, like the review of risk management files on a regular basis. Um, your monitoring and measurement of processes, design and development, most of the terms that we know and love and design controls are going to go away for more ambiguous um, terminology. And then your CAPA and non-conforming product procedures. And then again, more than just semantics, but your definitions have got to be updated and aligned throughout your procedures um, and your interpretation and application of those. I have created a, a check sheet that's particularly useful if you're a company that's wanting to do uh, business in the U.S. So uh, email my team if you want a copy of that. So. Question, how are you coaching your clients as they're, they're migrating? Uh, and, and 
there's going to be a tendency to cling to the known versus moving to the new QMSR. How are you helping to then transition your clients? Well, that's where I come in with uh, being your uh, grief counselor. <laughs> the last one here. Oh, it's like, like we, we, we technically have to, and I will be ready in advance of my clients being willing to go there so that even the stragglers, I've got like a plug and play solution because I do build custom quality management systems so I know what gaps need to be closed for all of my existing clients. <clears throat> Else? That's the danger of answering questions too completely. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Lott, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank you for sponsoring this event. Um, we have four sponsors, Michelle being one. She's just shared with you what she does. Uh, where's Eric? Eric uh, works uh, with our friend Brian Meshkin. Uh, those alumni will remember his